back in town on a red eye. Baby, don't make me wait. Body like, uh, uh, been a long while. And I just wanna taste this be alone. I put it down when I come home. All right, you guys, welcome back to Talk and Smack. I'm so excited to have you here. You and I met for the first time maybe like a month ago or so, but every talk that we had off camera, I was like, this guy needs to be on the pod. I am so excited to pick your brain. So this is Aaron. For those of you who don't know him, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you and what you do. I know we have your books here, and I'm really excited to talk about these. Absolutely. So my name is Aaron Janda, uh, founder of Legacy Publishing Company. Um, I actually started that company in Tulsa, Oklahoma during the pandemic, which is kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've been in business for over 10 years, had multiple six-figure businesses, Um lost both of those businesses through kind of, you know, crazy, uh, rogue business partnership. I went through a divorce. And, um, when I started sharing more of my story and I've written several books, um, I started meeting more people that wanted to share their story and it kind of, uh, motivated me to actually start the publishing company in the Mm -hmm. first place. That's so. so cool. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about the first book you wrote, which we have right here, actually my $100. My $100 project. Yep. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that and like why you wanted to write that and kind of what your thought process was behind all of that. All right. So it's kind of a cool story. So I had already um, built a cabinet business here in Seattle, built it up to six figures, scaled it in in a year, Um, did really well. I licensed that business over to a partner and then me and my wife at the time moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. So we moved across the country, uh, shoestring budget. Um, I was actually going to a financial seminar at the Renaissance Hotel in Tulsa. It's where Tiger Woods would stay mm-hmm. uh, when he was there for the PGA. And um, I'm pulling up to the meeting or the the event and I get out of the car and I look over and I see um, it looked like money was like wedged up under the, the tire in the car and I pull it out. It was a hundred dollar bill. And so my first thought was like, sweet, what can I go blow this on, you know, or mm-hmm. take my wife out to a nice dinner or something. And, and then, so I go into the lobby of the hotel. It's extravagant. It's like, you know, 30 floors up, you're sitting there. And I was looking at this hundred, I was like, what could I do with this hundred to turn it into a thousand? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I could get 10 of whatever I was going to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And so having, you know, ran and operated, you know, multiple businesses at that point, I was like, yeah, let's do that. And I had worked with like youth and young people in the past. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to do a case study. I'm going to force myself to take a hundred dollars and flip it up to a thousand. So, um, I basically just did that. So, you know, bought and sold some electronics, flipped some stuff up. Somebody wanted to, um, refinish their, their, their kitchen cabinets, which is what my business was in Seattle. Mm -hmm. So I took, you know, I built it up to about six, $700. Uh, I took $259 of that and bought supplies to do the job. They paid me 850 bucks and reimbursed me f- for supplies. So within like, <clears throat> I was charting the time that it was taking, not like, cause it was over the course of, you know, a couple months. Mm-hmm. Um, but I basically had um, taken a hundred dollars to about $1,400 mm-hmm. in like a couple of weeks. It was crazy. Yeah. Right. So I did that up to about 2,400 and eventually just stopped, but I journaled the process and I was like, you know what? I'm going to turn this into a book. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's how my hundred dollar project became a thing and uh, it ended up doing pretty well and kind of got me on this, this journey of like book writing and publishing Mm -hmm. and all that. That's incredible. I feel like the mindset behind that too, like even just like taking it back to thinking like, okay, I can go have fun with this hundred dollars or I can make it in something bigger. What was that mindset? Like what prompted you to actually be like, you know what? I could go do this, but I want to double this. I want to triple this. I want to get it to a point where I'm growing this money. And like, obviously having the tools that you had before in the business that you created here, but then just being like, you know what? Fuck it. (laughs) I'm going to take this in a different direction and I'm going to build this into something bigger. All right. So that's a really good question. So it's funny because I started that, that idea Mm -hmm. in 2013. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I had written several chapters. I didn't know anything about writing a book. Um, And I had reconnected with a friend of mine who's very entrepreneurial, you Mm -hmm. know, C-suite employee. He actually got the contract for the first um, 
uh, BlackBerry, if you can remember that device. Mm -hmm. He sold 100 Blackberries to a, a trucker, a, a guy that owned a trucking company, right? Mm -hmm. So like um, just super smart in the business world, et cetera, et cetera. He's like, I'm, I met up with him in 2015 when he moved to Dallas. I was in Tulsa at the time. And he's like, bro, that idea, hundred mm -hmm. taking a hundred bucks and flipping to a thousand, like you've already started writing a book. Like, why haven't you finished it yet? Yeah. So I had a friend, I had a voice, somebody to speak into my life that was able to sit, like kind of push me to like do it and mm -hmm. get it done. And within like two months, like I had a published book and I released it, mm -hmm. sold out my first print run. Um, it got into the hands of a the president of a regional bank in the area. He loved it so much because they were starting an entrepreneurship program for Tulsa. Yeah. And Tulsa's, you know, several years behind Seattle <laughs> and what I was used to. Uh -huh. But the next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call from his assistant saying, hey, this is so-and-so, uh, you know, assistant to such and such from, you know, president of such and such bank. And he got a copy of your book and he wants to invite you out to lunch. Mm -hmm. And I was like, let me check my calendar, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we met up at this little steakhouse downtown Tulsa and he loved it. And we started collaborating on some entrepreneurship stuff for the city. Mm -hmm. And um, the second book that I uh, co-authored, Influence and Income Online, I, auth I authored, I wrote a chapter called Authoring Influence. Mm -hmm. And so the whole concept, I hadn't made a million dollars online selling courses or whatever, like most of the people in the book, but I was like, what have I done? Mm -hmm. I wrote a book. It created a level of influence for me in the city. And so I wrote a chapter called Authoring Influence. Mm -hmm. And so within two months of meeting this, this president of this regional bank, I was getting invited to uh, penthouse suite parties downtown Tulsa. Mm -hmm. I was meeting CEOs, multimillionaires, politicians. We're at, you know, rooftop, mm -hmm. you know, for a Christmas party with all yeah. these influencers and, and significant people in the city, all because I wrote a book mm -hmm. and it got into one person's hand. That's so crazy to me, especially <clears throat> thinking about like this could have been a hundred dollars that you had just spent on something totally. and then it became something so much bigger than that and sent you on a trajectory that you probably never would have thought was an avenue that you would have wanted to go down. Changed my life. Changed my life. What's crazy is um, after I released the book, I was on the radio. I was like doing all this stuff and um, life happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, life happened. I had licensed a, a business to a partner who ended up stealing close to $250,000. Whoa. So I was living in one of the nicest houses in the nicest neighborhoods in Tulsa. If you lived on 121st street, people knew like, Oh, okay. Like they're this doing zip well. Do you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And like, and it was a blessing. Um, but what was crazy was when that all happened, it literally happened as I was creating this trajectory for myself through authorship, speaking and different things like that. And I lost everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had to move out of our house into a one bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like 70, 80 percent of our income mm -hmm. um, from that business. And I had to completely dissolve it. And mm -hmm. It created a series of events that kind of took me in a different trajectory. And 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 it, I would say it was about a three or four year hiatus. And now finally, you know, going through some of the stuff that I went through, now we're kind of rebirthing into mm -hmm. something that's new. And it's funny, even with this book, I'm editing it. I'm getting ready to re-release it because I feel like it's so relevant for mm -hmm. today. Like people need a side hustle. They need to figure out a way yeah. to make some extra money. And so, you know, something that I wrote, you know, back in 2015 is now even more relevant today. And, and so we've got, we've got that with a couple other projects that we're working on, but mm -hmm. this guy stole almost a quarter million or did steal a quarter million dollars from you. How come you didn't go after him? Especially when you had two lawsuits against, against you. So when this <laughs> happened in 2016, the lawsuits didn't come for like a year later. Okay. So again, like lawsuits came against me for debts I couldn't manage because of previous head business partner. Okay. Right. So, um, proximity, like we were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. This dude was in Seattle. Right. Yeah. And it's actually funny. You asked this, this is crazy. So at that time, everything was upside down. We lost the money. We were moving mm -hmm. into a one bedroom apartment. Uh, you know, my family member, you know, passing away with cancer, mm -hmm. wife leaving, right? Like, so many if things. If you were in that position, like, do you think you'd have, like, the capacity or the bandwidth to even, like, pursue something that, one, you don't know the outcome, It's right? going to take time and Years, money. Years, most likely. A bunch of money that I didn't have, 
right? So I just, I, I, I just, I was like, I, I didn't have the bandwidth to do it. So here's what's funny. So four and a half years after that happened, this is like last year. Okay. Mm-hmm. I hadn't moved back to Seattle. Yet. I'm still in Oklahoma, but I was here visiting. I reached out to legal counsel. Okay. And um, the person that was giving me the advice and the counsel, um, this is the part of the bar exam that they aced. Mm. Okay. Was business contractual law. Okay. Mm-hmm. So they aced this part. So okay. if anybody knows yeah. my rights, you know, what I'm entitled to, et cetera, et cetera, it would have been this person at this moment for this situation. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And they basically told me, they said, um, when did this happen, et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, this is like summer of last year. And they said, you still are within the statute of limitations till the end of the year. And I was like, okay, so I've, I've rebuilt my life. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm in a good headspace. Mm-hmm. I got have a business. I, you know, like, like what I couldn't do four and a half years prior, like I could now do. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I went back to Tulsa after having this conversation that I was still in the statute of limitations. I could have sued this guy easily for three to 400 grand because it also comes with not just the money lost, but it comes with like the pain and suffering mm-hmm. and all the stuff. Like I literally lost everything. I went through a divorce, all that stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it all is relevant right. in a, in a legal case. And, uh, I prayed about it. I was like, God, what do I do? Mm-hmm. Like I lost all this money. Like I paid off over 120 grand of debt through my divorce mm-hmm. within like three and a half years. Um, but I, f- I still felt like I didn't have anything to show for it. Right. It's like, okay, great. I paid off all this debt, but I still have nothing to show for it. I was like, you know, an extra three, 400K would be nice right about now, right? Yeah. And I was wrestling with it for like two solid weeks. And, uh, you know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says the meek shall inherit the earth. I don't know if you've heard that. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you actually study that out a little bit, see, people think meek is like, oh, yeah, lowly and just, mm-hmm. mm, just kind of cower down. Like derogatory almost. Yeah, it's, it's like, oh, I'm just going to roll over and just take everything right. that happens. It actually means the complete opposite. Mm-hmm. So that word meek in that context, that that uh, you know Greek or Hebrew word, it's a military term. Mm-hmm. It's like wielding a sword mm-hmm. and having the ability to use it, but choosing not to. Mm-hmm. So there's also a st- uh, you know story in the Bible where um, you know the old king Saul was pursuing David, King David, David and Goliath. You probably heard mm-hmm. of that. Um, they were literally pursuing David to kill him. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're asleep. David, being the better king, the better warrior, shows up, finds this dude, Saul, and he cuts a little piece of his little garment off and lays it on him Mm -hmm. as like, uh, I could have killed you and chose not to. Mm -hmm. Meek inheriting the earth, the people that are going to inherit the earth and have the most, um, is, is literally being able, having the power to destroy something, someone mm-hmm. and choosing not to. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, going through that, I, I ultimately decided I'm just, I mean, breadcrumbs, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like wash your hands with it. And, and I, I literally had the power to destroy this dude, the big old house that he built, you know, because of all the money that he made mm-hmm. could have totally taken him out. I chose not to. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I let the six months that was remaining in my statute of limitations just go by and, I'm glad mm-hmm. I did. You know, yeah. I'm glad. You know, it's not even worth the the effort or the the, the emotional energy that it would take to pursue something like that. Because mm-hmm. I know if I've done it several times, made multiple six figures, you know, created these businesses, like I can do it again. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's exactly. kind of what I'm working on. No, I think that's huge, and especially like thinking about your morals to be like, you know what, this isn't worth it to me to basically put someone through, even though they put me through so much suffering. For me to be able to take a step back and say, I don't want to do that to somebody. Yeah. Like, even if they did cause so many hardships in your life, like, that's just, that's huge. And not a lot of people can say that, you know, they had all the power to use a sword and they chose not to. Mm. And I actually went to private Christian school. So any single Bible story <laughs> that you share, yeah, I like, I love relating things back to Bible stories yeah. or like explaining them to people who, didn't go to like a private school or didn't grow up in a home that had, you know, study of the Bible. Yeah. 
I just think, I think it's so fascinating to look at the stories and see what we can pull from them yeah. and learn from them. It, I mean, it completely changed my perspective because mm -hmm. Moses was the most meek man on all the earth. Mm -hmm. Like you're like, holy crap, you know, like it had nothing to do with just being this wimpy little cowardice little mm -hmm. just, you know. And he was a leader. He was, mm -hmm. you know, so that's why I didn't, that's why I didn't pursue it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also writing a book called Refuse to Quit. Mm -hmm. I'm not plug like I'm not trying to plug, but no, like, no please I'm just, do. I'm excited because I'm like like these stories like people need to hear the mm -hmm. dude at the UW Stadium. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like refuse to quit. It was going to be called Don't Quit, mm -hmm. but I felt like Don't Quit was like Don't Quit, right? Yeah. Like you're telling somebody to do something. Mm -hmm. um, I was flying through. Where was I? This was recently. I was flying through. Uh, Salt Lake City, Utah was my connection from Seattle back to Tulsa. Mm -hmm. um, there was weather and uh, they canceled my flight. Mm -hmm. I had to be back. I was managing a car dealership in Tulsa at the time. I needed to be back. Yeah. Right. Like, and uh, they canceled the flight due to weather. Well, ride a carriage and the stuff. You look at the fine print, like if it's weather related, they don't have to comp your flight. They don't have to comp your, your hotel stay. And uh, I had to like book myself in a hotel room at my own expense because mm -hmm. of the weather. Right. And I was, I wanted to be frustrated. I was like, this is ridiculous. Dude, I had the most restful, peaceful mm -hmm. night. I kind of changed my perspective on the experience. And as I was going to the airport, the shuttle driver, this is so crazy because everyone has a story. Mm -hmm. The shuttle driver from Italy moved to the U.S. as an immigrant, you know, 30 some odd years ago. And he was telling me a, a story about how somebody had basically stolen like 70, 80 grand, you know, like he was investing into something that didn't work out and dude stole the money and like he's driving the shuttle, mm -hmm. you know, like that's got to be humbling. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Probably kids, probably grandkids. He's driving the shuttle. And I was just sharing. I was like, bro, like just know that like your story, like thank you for sharing your story with me. Mm -hmm. And on that shuttle ride from the hotel back to the airport, I had this thought and it was like, refuse to quit. That's the mm -hmm. title of that book. You're giving people the choice, the option mm -hmm. to refuse to quit. Yeah. And so we're working on that too, but. I love that. Well, and I think too, like thinking about any time a flight's been canceled or delayed or something or an Uber ride cancels on me or whatever, I look at it like as a blessing from God. Like I wasn't meant to be in that Uber. I wasn't meant to be on this plane. I wasn't meant to be in this certain thing. And I choose to look at it like, oh, well, if we had left 30 minutes earlier on time, maybe we'd have gotten in a car accident or yeah. maybe we'd have this would have happened. And I feel like it's we're it's so easy for us to get frustrated about the situation that we're yeah. in. And if we choose to a different perspective and look at it in a way that's positive, one, it calms us down. <laughs> and it's yeah. so much easier to actually just take a step back and be like, you know what? I'm here for a reason. This is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And you wouldn't have been able to hear his story if your flight hadn't got canceled. Yeah. And like, yeah. I think, I mean, like I said before, it's so easy to get frustrated and go straight to anger instead of looking at it through a different lens and think, okay, I'm being placed here for a specific reason. I may not know what that is yet, yeah. but I, I think it's so powerful to change our perspective and it allows us to be happier. What got you through that? Realizing, oh my gosh, like I'm so accustomed to this certain lifestyle that I've built for myself. And now like maybe you felt like you were going backwards and you had to like take so many steps back and be like, okay, I need to rethink all these things. Like what was your mindset around money at that point? What was your mindset around partnerships at that point? And how did you get through that to get to, to a place where you are now? And I mean, you and I have talked off camera and how fired up about, you know, what you're doing now and just like, what was that like? End of 2015, 2016 was a very crazy, like 2016 was the worst year of my life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that business partner, you know, stealing, you know, over $200,000. A few months later, um, I ended up losing a family member to cancer. Mm -hmm. um, I was visiting them and I came home from that trip to find that my wife at the time had left me. Uh, she had shut down her cleaning business that, you know, we had started together and, um, I was like, what the heck, you mm -hmm. know? And she left like my income. And then I had to dissolve the business that I was operating. It was a direct sales company at that time that was generating a good amount of income. I had to dissolve that because of the separation. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
I ended up moving back to Seattle um, about you know five six months later to try to save the relationship, and um, it ended up you know ending in divorce. Anyways, mm -hmm. I got to Seattle in 2017, and I had basically two two lawsuits against me from Fortune two five Fortune 500 companies. So that was my welcome back to Seattle in oh. 2017. My gosh. And so all of this happened, you know, obviously the book stuff like that just completely went flat, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was finally starting to taste like, you know, a sense of like purpose and what mm -hmm. I wanted to do. And it just completely went flat. I'm back in Seattle, no money, two lawsuits. And I had to figure out what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I basically, you know, having been in sales a long time, I started selling life insurance. I was mm -hmm. traveling to Idaho, Montana, Oregon. Like it was insane mm -hmm. um, just to try to stay afloat, really. Right. Um, you know, when the business partner took all that money, we were living on credit cards. So when we had to move out of our mm -hmm. house uh, early 2016 into a one bedroom apartment, credit cards, credit cards, we started accumulating debt fast. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, not it's only easy did, to do. Not only was it traumatic, mm -hmm. you know, for me and my wife at the time, like I get that, you know, it was crazy. Um, we, we accumulated, you know, I mean, it was, and, and then, so for me having been a business owner at that point, I didn't want to go back and get a job making 15 bucks an hour. No. So what do I do, I invest 20 grand into a business. I got into the car business, was doing well, et cetera, et cetera, but I ended up having to dissolve that as well. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was insane. So, you know, now you're looking 60, 70, 80 grand of debt, mm -hmm. no money, no income. Yeah. And then moving back to Seattle to try to figure it all out and, and get back on my feet. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was, it was pretty crazy. So to answer your question, like there was a lot of, you know, once the, you know, the divorce finalized, <clears throat> there was a lot of rediscovery that had to take place, right? Like, you know, I had some wins, but those are some significant L's, you mm -hmm. know, as well. Yeah. And it's like you start as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you start to second guess yourself and that's your secret power, right? Mm -hmm. When you see an opportunity, you need to know to jump or not jump. Right. And I was finding myself not jumping because mm -hmm. I was second guessing myself. My confidence was down here when it used to be up here. Right. And uh, it's been a, over four years, you know, mm -hmm. of a journey, you know, to really come back to a place where, you know, that confidence is there, mm -hmm. the willingness to take risks and step out is there. And then I just moved back to Seattle a few months ago, mm -hmm. which was also another big risk. Mm -hmm. I lived on a golf course. I had my life. It was comfortable, et cetera, et yeah. cetera. And I'm like, no, I need to, you know, I just, I felt this, this pull back to the city that I'm from mm -hmm. um, to really take, you know, the publishing company and, and the books to the next level. So mm -hmm. here we are. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. And thank you so much for sharing all of that. Cause I know that, you know, it's not easy to be vulnerable. It's not easy to talk about all those things. And I really appreciate that you're completely an open book because I know, I know how hard that is. I don't like to share stuff. <laughs> you guys know this, but like once you get to it, like, I feel like that breeds connection and like relatability to other people. And I'm sure a lot of the listeners, I'm sure some of them can relate. Some of them can't, but they can like empathize with everything that you've been through. And, you know, what was that like? coming back to Seattle. All right. I want to share a story. So this is crazy. <laughs> I haven't really, I haven't shared this vocally on any kind of social media, YouTube, Ooh. nothing. Talking smack exclusive. Okay. Talking smack. <laughs> so when I moved back to Seattle, you know, from 2017, to 2019, try to save the relationship. Like I was renting a 10 by 10 bedroom. Mm -hmm. In a hat, like I was like, this is insane to me. Like yeah. I went from this to yeah. this, and I had to, I, like, I signed up for a a, a temp gig, mm -hmm. right? Like down in like Everett, Linwood, or somewhere in there. So I roll up to this 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 temp gig, right? And like you're going through the the computer, you're putting in. They're like, "Are you addicted addicted to methamphetamine?" Like all this stuff. I'm like, <gasps> "Dude, this is freaking nuts, right?" Yeah. But I needed money. Like mm -hmm. I needed to make some money. I didn't have a job. And I think this is where like the entrepreneurs, like they're willing to do whatever mm -hmm. it's going to take to do what needs to be done. Right. So I'm like, all right, boom. I go through the app process. They're like, all right, cool. We got something for you tomorrow. You know, eight o'clock show up here, 8 a.m. Da, da, da. You, pr you will never be able to guess the job that I had to show up for at 8 a.m. Basically we had to go to UW stadium Mm -hmm. 
after a game. So it was the day following a big game and we had to clean the entire stadium. When I tell you it was raining, it's an open stadium. There was literally like 20 people that showed up. They strapped leaf blowers to our back. Okay. And we had to go to the top of the stadium, the top row, and they literally had us lined up like 20 rows. Mm -hmm. The first person would go about five, and they're blowing all this crap, trash, people's half-eaten hot dogs. It's rainy. It's wet. And and then, you know, they go five, ten feet, then the next person goes. And you literally just blowing Mm-hmm. Why did I end up as the dude at the bottom of the line? <laughs> so like, like all the crap and what like mixed with all the stuff like was mm-hmm. ending up in my row, mm-hmm. getting all over my shoes and all this stuff. Like mm-hmm. it was the most humbling experience I think I've ever experienced in my life mm-hmm. to make a few bucks. Like I needed the money. Like, yeah. And I was like, this is absolutely wild. So at one point in this day, there's a point, like at one point in this day, um, one of the guys is like, you know, they got those little golf carts or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we had to, you know, go to a different level of the stadium. So, and for whatever reason, like it just ended up being me and him. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're in the cart. He's driving me down to like the lower level. This dude's there, man. He's hustling. He's grinding, you know, he's, he's got like a kid, you know, and he's struggling financially and. And we just started talking and I was like, I was like, bro, you're not going to believe like, like the reason why I'm here is this, this, and this, I lost this, I lost this, mm-hmm. I'm going through a divorce, like, and I just, I, I just shared that. And like, I didn't know this until about six, nine months later, um, he reached out to me on social media Mm -hmm. and he's like, Aaron, he's like, I remember that conversation we had over at the stadium. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I've been watching what you're doing. I've been watching your story and like just how you've continued to press through. Like, he's like, I was suicidal. I was this, that, and the other. Like, he was like, just seeing you move forward Mm -hmm. has, and and he, he actually said this. He said, I've been wanting to reach out to you for months. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I finally got the courage to do it. And and we were able to hop on the phone and we were able to talk. And I was able to just kind of encourage me more. Like that blew my mind. Like mm-hmm. I was literally at my lowest point and he was kind of like on the come up, right? Like yeah. working a job, da, da, da. Like, and we met here on this day. Mm-hmm. Will never happen again. And we met at that moment. And it made an impact on his life. Mm-hmm. You know, like my lowest point was somebody else's you know, midpoint. Encouragement. And it just, it, it rocked me. Mm-hmm. Like it messed me up. I was like, dang, mm-hmm. like it doesn't really matter what you go through in life. As long as you're able to take that and turn it into something, you know, positive. Mm-hmm. If you can do that for somebody else, like, dude, I'm mm-hmm. like happy as a clam. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> like looking at it, like, okay, when you realize like, okay, this divorce is going to be final. What was that like for you finding yourself again and being like, who am I as an individual and not this like couple that I've been so accustomed to being and who am I on my own and what do I want? So, so I was living in, in Seattle from 2017, 2019. So that's when I'd come back to try to save the relationship, Mm -hmm. counseling, do all the tools, do all the things. Um, unfortunately it still ended in divorce three days after the divorce finalized. I felt like God told me you need to go back to Tulsa. Mm-hmm. So for me, Tulsa, and we didn't, really, I mean, there's a lot to, there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had first moved to Tulsa in 2006 to go to school. Mm-hmm. And that was m- my first major leap of faith, mm-hmm. if you will, like to step out of my hometown, mm-hmm. move to another city, know no one, go to school, didn't know if it was going to work out, et cetera, et cetera. So after the divorce happened, I felt like I was going back to my roots of my faith, mm-hmm. just just going back to the point where my life got really good, you mm-hmm. know? So I was kind of like refining myself. I moved back to Tulsa 2019 to until this year, essentially three and a half years. 
And I thought I was going to go back to Tulsa and, you know, buy a house and get a spouse and, Mm -hmm. you know, like all these investment opportunities down there and, and all this business stuff. And what I realized in that three and a half year season in Tulsa that I just came out of, it was more for me. It was more, Mm -hmm. you know, introspection. It was more rediscovering like, Mm -hmm. who am I? Who's Aaron Janda? You Mm -hmm. know, like, what am I passionate about and, and how can I make an impact And it was several years of figuring that out. Plus the pandemic happened 2020. Mm -hmm. I'm there. I have some friends, but no family. I was very isolated. There were some dark times, um, you know, which I feel like most of us experienced Mm -hmm. um, through that. Um, But I had that compounded on everything else that I was going through as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so gradually I started getting involved. I co-authored a couple of books. Um, they did really well. They became bestsellers. And I was like, man, like I really enjoy writing. I really enjoy, you know, sharing my story and my experiences. And, you know, as those book projects started to get traction and we're going hitting bestseller lists and everything, people started reaching out to me and they're like, I want to write a book. You know, I, you know, can you help me write a book? And, And, um, you know, I was like, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. However I can help. I didn't realize that was going to turn into a full fledged business Mm -hmm. at that time. And so the more I started connecting with people, hearing their stories, their traumatic experiences, their successes, their L's, it motivated me to push forward this time. My third business, um, it wasn't about the money. Mm Mm-hmm. It was more about legit like purpose, like mm-hmm. how can I help as many people as possible through story and books and and all of that. And something switched. Mm-hmm. Like I was like, okay, like this is, yeah, the money will come and all that, but I want to help as many people as possible, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, kind of our little slogan for legacy publishing is, you know, changing the world one reader at a time. Mm-hmm. Like that takes a lot of pressure off me as a writer because if yeah. one person reads this book and it changes their life or prevents them from, you know, uh, suicide, which, you know, like mm-hmm. I, I experienced all that, like high level, like depression, like those thoughts, those suicidal thoughts, everything. Like I experienced all of that mm-hmm. and I came out of it. Mm-hmm. If I write something or share something or this podcast, what you're doing, like, you know, if it can like provoke one person to just say, Hey, you know what? It can work out. You can Mm -hmm. lose, lose everything. You can go a hundred steps backwards and still come back Mm -hmm. and then go even further. Like then I've, I've done, you know, like what I feel like I'm called to do, you Mm -hmm. know? And I feel like now, you know, coming into my forties, like I'm just getting started, you know, and I'm fired up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think that's incredible. I think you know, were there any things specifically that helped pull you out of like that depression and that feeling in that state? Like were there there things that you did or people that you talked to or books that helped you like out of that? I mean, first and foremost, it's God, it's God you know, yeah. like I have a strong faith, um, you know, went to, you know, Bible school, I've done missions work all around the world. Like, you know, like I've seen God move in, in, in crazy ways. Um, so, you know, a lot of people look at like faith or God or religion as like a crutch. And I, I look at it in a completely different way. Like God, (laughs) I believe God and I'm trying to get religious or anything, Mm -hmm. but you know, like, like, I believe God wants to have a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. We are all created for community and Mm -hmm. relationship, right? And when you realize that there is a God that loves you and wants to have a personal relationship with you, like I've just seen too many, I've had too many experiences where something supernatural has happened to save my life. Um, Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like um, I would say that is the number one, you know, thing that helped me through, um, you know, and, and obviously hearing other people's stories, mm-hmm. right? Like it was crazy when I was going through the, like the worst time of my life, mm-hmm. I felt like God was bringing people into my life mm-hmm. that had been through worse stuff that I'd been through. I mean, I met a guy who in Tulsa married over 20 years. They were in ministry, moved to California to start a church. After six months, his wife's like, I don't want to be married to you. I don't want to, mm-hmm. you know do church anymore. Like, 
like this guy's got kids, like dang near grandkids mm-hmm. at this point, right? And like, sh- and and she just didn't want any more of it. Like, you can't control that, mm-hmm. right? And so, like that, that showed me that there was still hope. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't like the fact that he said it took him seven years. Yeah, right. Like, and mm-hmm. I'm like four and a half years, you know, post divorce at this mm-hmm. point. Um, and I'm like, okay, I get it. Like. It takes time mm-hmm. to to rebuild your life. It takes time to get your confidence back, your direction, your purpose back because you kind of had your life mm-hmm. kind of in your head like yeah. already mapped out like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to have kids. We're going to do this, this, this. Mm-hmm. And when all that's gone, like you have to do some serious introspection to really, mm-hmm. you know, ask yourself like, what do I want to do? If it's just me and God, you mm-hmm. know, like, and then God will bring people into your life to help you, you know, do that. And, mm-hmm. um, so that would, that would probably be the, the yeah. thing that helped me. Mm-hmm. No, I totally feel that. I feel like touching on what you said about like, okay, I had my whole life mapped out. Like I felt that same exact way when I got married and then I got divorced two years later. And for me, it was very much like, and I think, I I mean, before I forget this thought, like thinking about time, it does take time. And so many people, and I think because of social media mainly think, oh, this is supposed to happen overnight. Like I'm supposed to be good or I'm supposed to be this. And like so many people think they have to put that mask on of I'm okay. I'm good. I'm this, I'm that, I'm whatever. And that doesn't set you up for success because it just bottles everything up. It pushes everything down. And for me, when I got divorced, I was the same way. I was like, my timeline is completely out of, (laughs) I don't have a timeline now. And I think that actually helped me in like dating afterwards in that sense or being like, okay, I'm ready to actually like meet someone that I want to build a life with instead of being like, I need to get married and then I'm going to have kids and then I'm going to do this and that and the other. And like just being more flexible with my own timeline, because like that saying, you make plans and God laughs. And (laughs) I think you're totally right. Like God does want to have a connection with each and every one of us. And I think we go through things for a reason because we can learn from them and honestly, like lean on him more in that sense. And when I was going through my divorce, There was so many times like where we hadn't filed yet that I was just like, am I doing the right thing? I don't know. And then I would read my Bible and there would be a passage and I'm like, yep, I'm making the right. Oh, no, I'm tossing (laughs) things all over. I'd be like, oh, I'm, you know, maybe I'm not making the right decision. Maybe, you know, I should stick this out. But I feel like intuitively, like we know what's right for us and we know that like things are going to work out. And I think having the mindset of, I'm just going to make it work. And basically what I'm trying to get at is like the timeline of things. Like I think so many people are so hard on themselves or hearing you say like you're entering your forties and you're so fired up about things. Like I'm 28 and I was like, Oh, if I, if 20 year old Mackenzie looked at 28 year old Mackenzie, she'd think, Oh, we've got babies by now. We've got this, we've got that. We've got the other, but like just trusting his timeline and knowing that things are going to work out the way that they're supposed to. And chances are they're going to work out better than we ever imagined. If we do lean on him, if we do trust like those intuition, like that gut, like you said, like God told you, or like you had that intuition that like, oh, I need to move back to Tulsa and like find yourself again. And I think for me, like when my ex-husband like moved out, I very much was like, who am I? (laughs) Like, who is Mackenzie? (laughs) And I feel like I've, I've said this before, like I've put so much of my identity into like, I'm a business owner. I'm a wife. I'm a dog mom. I'm like all these other things. And someone asked me what my hobbies were. And I was like, I don't know. (laughs) Like, what do you mean hobbies? And like, I think it's been so cool taking a step back and just thinking, okay, what actually brings me joy? What brings me happiness? Where do I feel calm? Where do I feel excited? Like, where does my passion lie? And hearing you say, okay, this business wasn't for the money. This was for if I can change one person's mind or if I can help one person, like 
like you said, it takes the pressure off because you're speaking to someone specifically. And I think I look at that like with my social media, like, okay, the tips that I share, the value that I give, if this helps one person, that's worth it to me. I don't care about the number of likes I get. I don't care about the number of sales I get. Like that more like impact driven goal rather than like monetary driven goal. I feel it can be so much greater. Have you noticed like a lot of the high net individuals like that we know of today? Like, all right. So they'll say it's not about the money. Right. And you're like, oh, that's easy for you to say. You got all the freaking money in the world. Mm -hmm. But like, I think if you can kind of read between the lines, you're actually starting to realize what they're saying is true. Mm -hmm. So I've heard, I heard somebody once say this, your lifestyle changes more when you hit a six figure income versus seven, eight, nine. Mm -hmm. And I I looked at my own life. I was like, okay, yeah, that actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. When you start making like, you know, five figures a month, you know, like the car you drive changes a little bit, Mm -hmm. you know, you're like, oh, wow. I went from a Honda Civic to a Mercedes Benz, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, you know, the house you live in changes, right? Like the people that you're socializing with changes Mm -hmm. um, more so than when you hit seven figures. And so like, you know, you know, being a six figure entrepreneur versus a seven, like I haven't reached it yet. Like I know that's going to happen, but it's not going to come from, you know, just pursuing money, right? Mm -hmm. Like the people that are making the most impact in the world, they got to a point where, okay, my money issues are resolved. I don't Mm -hmm. have to worry about my bills, debt, et cetera, et cetera. Now I just want to impact as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's, there's something to be said there about that. Um, you know, and so even with my own business, right? Like, yeah, like we charge a fee to like publish books and all this, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and there's a lot of work that goes into a building a business. You mm-hmm. understand that, right? And and I think that's part of the reason why I was so hesitant because I knew like, okay, bro, like mm-hmm. do I even really want to do this again? Mm-hmm. You know, and and the motivation when I started hearing people's stories of this girl, you know, as a child getting thrown out of a glass door, like, you know, in her chapter, it starts like, you know, you know, glass that shattered into a thousand pieces, you know, you're like, holy crap. Mm -hmm. Like what people went through, like I went through some crazy stuff, but there's people that went through even crazier stuff. And, you know, like just being motivated by that, by people and, you know, helping them, it's, it's more motivating than, you know, having the, the, the ones and zeros in your bank account. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's why you see a lot of high net individuals doing more for the community doing you know mm-hmm. stuff you know uh ha- you know marshawn lynch we're in seattle right like mm-hmm. handing out turkeys and thanksgiving right like when mm-hmm. you can touch somebody at a very um you know basic level of like basic human needs like food and mm-hmm. and monetarily like um that makes more of an impact than just you know like you telling them something they should do or they know mm-hmm. you know yeah um well, and I feel like those more like impact driven goals keep you going for longer. They keep you passionate about them for longer because if it's about the money, like you may not be passionate about a certain course you're creating. And then like people see that people can read through you pretty easily. But if you have that impact driven goal, that passion around actually truly helping people, I feel like it's something that's sustainable and something that you like, that's not going to go away. Like you, the need or want to help other people, it's not going to go away. And of course, the hunger for money isn't going to go away either, but it's going to be a lot harder if they're more shallow goals like the, oh, I want the Mercedes or I want the, I want that Louis bag or I want this, that and the other. (laughs) Because you get those things and you're still like, once you get them, you're like, okay, well, what's next? Yeah. Instead of like, how many people can I help? How many people can I impact? How can I make a difference in other people's lives? Because you're just want you're just gonna want to grow that, and you're gonna want to impact more and more people. And I feel like it's so much easier to stick with something like that. But tell us about the book that you're writing now, and um, tell us the name of it. All right. So this is this is the manuscript. Your story matters. So one of the projects we're working on. Um, it's, it's basically going to be a, a six part book series mm-hmm. called your story matters. Yeah. And after I started doing these, these co-author books, like I, I, I recognize the value of being able to, you know, pull different people's stories together 
and um, you know, with a common theme, right? So like, you know, I co-authored a book called Overcoming Adversity and Entrepreneurship, The Kingdom Mind, right? Like this is more like faith-based stuff, mm-hmm. right? Entrepreneurs that are faith-based. Your story matters. A lot of people in this book, like, and this is this is gonna be launching like for pre-order in like the next week. So by the time you guys see this, like it'll be live on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um is is just that is it's helping people share their stories you know like 84 percent of people like have thought about or wanted to write a book Mm -hmm. less than five percent ever do Mm -hmm. you know when they say like the graveyard is the wealthiest place on earth that is facts Mm -hmm. right like so many unwritten songs stories movies books right like because people didn't take the step to actually do it um so I'm taking people's stories, people that maybe thought about or wanted to write a book. And I'm like, hey, let's be a part of this project. I want to help share your story and you don't have to write a full book. Mm-hmm. Just write me one chapter. Yeah. Write me 2,500 words. Give me a photo and we'll put you on. And I spoke with somebody in the publishing industry of 40 years. He's done, you know, million copy print runs for some of the biggest names that you would recognize. Mm-hmm. And he's like, holy cow, Aaron, like I've never thought of that Mm -hmm. is, is, is really leveraging like Mm -hmm. co-authorship. You, you know, you're hitting bestseller status, you're getting people kind of in that groove of writing. And, and, you know, I would say, you know, 30 to 40% of the people that contribute, they end up going on to write their own books. Mm -hmm. And those are some of my clients, Yeah, you know? And so it's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of crazy, but it's, it's fun. It's cool. I think that's incredible, especially too. I feel like in this world so many people look at that like oh i don't want to collaborate with anyone else because i don't want anyone else to shine more than me or whatever that looks like or we look at everyone else like competition and for you to look at it like no this is something that i can leverage we can all come together and be a team and all promote this i think that's so incredible because not a lot of people look at things that way i think more people are starting to look at it like okay we can collaborate and we can create something amazing and especially to hear that feedback from someone who's been in the industry for 40 years and like seeing how cool that is i can't wait to order the book (laughs) we're gonna drop a link when this (laughs) um episode airs but you guys should definitely order his book um but i just think i just think that's so incredible I think most people fall into like a scarcity mindset or an abundance mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is enough to go around for us all to eat. Yeah. They say, now I don't know who they is, (laughs) but they say if you were to take all the world's resources, so Mm -hmm. minerals, you know, gold, silver, that's just within the earth that we already have Mm -hmm. and distributed it evenly uh, amongst 7 billion people, we would all be worth about $27 trillion. That's insane, yeah. right? So, you know, regardless of, you know, how you feel about, you know, this economic s- structure or that, like the point is there's so much to go around. Mm-hmm. And some of the most successful people that I follow, like they're like, look, why do you think podcasts are so good, right? Mm-hmm. Like why do you think they work so well now is because they're collaborating with other people right. and cross-pollinating each other's networks. That's why I went this route with the mm-hmm. co, like the co-author book, concept is what helped me bootstrap my publishing company Mm -hmm. because people were paying to contribute like because it's a kind of a marketing thing Mm -hmm. um you're able to promote what you're doing within the book and people are able to connect with you you've got 15 other people promoting the book so Mm -hmm. people you would never connect with you know like um it's not up here but i co-authored a book called influence and income online right that's the Mm -hmm. one that i wrote the authoring influence Mm -hmm. well the people on that um Influence income online. So, so James Miley, he's a good friend of mine. He's, you know, $210 million in sales. He's done executive wow. level consulting for multiple Fortune 5 companies. You, mm-hmm. you hear Fortune 500? Like, no, he's like Fortune 5 means like the top five companies in the world. Wow. And, and I had the opportunity to, to co author this book, write one chapter. Mm-hmm. It became bestseller in five categories above Gary V, Tony wow. Robbins, all that. And, and now like the people that contributed to that, we're all in this kind of like special little club, like, oh yeah, yeah, I I co-authored that book with you or, you know, Mm -hmm. when we meet and stuff and uh, you're able to cross pollinate each other's networks, right? Like that's abundance mindset. Mm -hmm. That's like, there's so much to go around. Like let's help promote each other. Like a rising tide floats all ships. Right. And so, uh, I've just chosen to have that mindset Mm -hmm. versus, 
I can't teach you everything I know because then you're going to take from me. Mm-hmm. It's like, nah. Yeah. Like, like yeah. if I can help you do something or create a six figure business or do this or that, like mm-hmm. we're all winning, you yeah. know? And I think, I think that that's what makes things move forward, you know, f- mm-hmm. from a societal standpoint and an entrepreneurship standpoint mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that to relate back to like me and my industry, like if I had looked at that when I was first starting with clients and was like, oh, there's not enough people to go around. Like I need to withhold my information. My training business wouldn't be as good as it is because I have no problem giving every single person all the knowledge that I have because they're going to do it different than me. And and I think that's what's so special is each person is so different and inherently their own like unique, sparkly, special person. And that's what makes collaboration so exciting is because we're all different. We might agree on a lot of things. There might be some things we don't, you know, agree on, but like being truly yourself and like knowing that you have value to share and your voice matters and you're special Like you're going to attract the people who are into you and then the people who aren't like they're just not meant for you and that's okay. Like I'm sure this book, some people might feel really drawn to certain chapters, but they're going to get value from other chapters, but they might be like, okay, I need to go buy this book from this individual person. And, you know, if a hundred people read it and divvy that up between all the readers, different people are going to feel more connected to different authors. hundred percent. And I feel like exactly like you said, there's enough people to go around yeah. And it shouldn't be looked at anymore as a competition other than like, okay, we align, we're going to be homies and you're going to buy from me or I'm going to provide you a service that you really like or so on and so forth rather than looking at it like, oh, there's not enough to go around. So I need to be secretive. And like, this brings me to a different point. You're creating online courses. Is that correct? Mm. Can we talk about that? <laughs> sure, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll be taking pre-orders by the time you see this. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that. Are you going to – so I know we've talked off camera a little bit about this, but are you going to be helping other people basically write their own books and publish them themselves, like self-publish? Or are you going to kind of – or is there going to be like different tiers? Tell us a little bit about that. Funny you should ask. <laughs> All right, so no. Oh, you have something else too. So well, so okay, so here I'll (laughs) (laughs) take this one back. Um, no, here, here, here's the bottom line. When I wrote this first book right here, my hundred dollar project, it cost me about twenty five hundred bucks to self publish. Okay, so if just talking about books for a minute, so we see Uber versus the taxi industry, right? Okay. Taxi industry is like a dinosaur mm-hmm. and Uber figured out a way to bring it into the, the present or the future, right? Mm-hmm. And it was disruptive. I mean, there were states that were making laws to prevent Uber drivers mm-hmm. from driving because they wanted to go into the taxi cab industry. Right. 20 years ago, if you wanted to write a book, you know how that happened? You literally had to write your book, create, edit, do all the things – create a manuscript and you had to, at your own expense, print off 30, 40 copies, you know, like Mm -hmm. of your book and send it to all these big box publishers and hope that one person or one publisher would be like, yes, we want to publish your book. Mm -hmm. You had no control. Right. And it was like left to chance or your connections or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now with like, with like Amazon and, you know, Kindle direct publishing and all these tools, you can self publish a book. Right. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to ask anybody's permission. Right. If you have a story, you can publish a book. Mm -hmm. Right. So you've got self publish, you've got um, big box publishing. And then what we do is more boutique publishing, right? So we're kind of in the middle. Mm-hmm. So we're helping you do all the back end stuff that you don't want to have to worry about, but yourself, it's like a glorified self publishing, right? So, you know, even for boutique publishers, a lot of them will still charge 25 to 50% royalty on each book that you sell. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you sell, you know, a thousand books, we get 50%. Mm-hmm. legacy publishing my company like we don't want to make money off of everyone's royalties mm-hmm. so you keep a hundred percent of your royalties mm-hmm. we just do all the back-end work to help you self-publish so you retain a hundred percent of the rights etc mm-hmm. etc um so this co- this book cost me 2500 bucks i had to find an editor typesetter cover design all the stuff right like and it took a little bit of work like it was a lot of work actually um so 
not everyone has 2,500 bucks. Mm -hmm. Now that cost has gone up to four to five grand, right? Mm -hmm. This was seven years ago. Um, so there's an associated cost with wanting to publish a book. I understand most people can't drop four or five grand to publish a book. So I started, uh, yes, like to answer your question, I'm developing a course right now on how to um, write and publish a book within 90 days. So mm -hmm. basically how to write a and write a book in 30 days and then the subsequent 60 days basically publish have a published book in 90 days mm -hmm. um and so i basically reverse engineered this i created a, a workbook um i'm still filming some of the videos for it um but you know for you know five hundred thousand bucks they can get the course and then mm -hmm. it's basically teaching them how to write and publish the book on their own so they don't have to hire me Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then if they take the course and they find, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work on the back end. I don't want to deal with editors and cover designers. They can hire me or hire my company to do the do it for them. And then we'll actually give them a credit mm -hmm. from what they paid for the course mm -hmm. for the publishing package. That's so, so cool. Uh, so well, they don't I will lose money by yeah. the, paying for the course. Well, I will be buying this course because okay. <laughs> one day I want to write a book. Okay. And I said in my 28th year, I want to write a book. So if it really helps me in 30 days, I'm going to be hyping this course up All right. <laughs> like crazy. Hey, let's go, let's so go. I can't wait to take it. I think that's so cool. I think, and I think so many people, I mean, even my mom has said, she's like, I've always wanted to write a book. I'm like, well, why haven't you? She's like, I don't know. Like, and like you said, like however many percentage of people, I mean, a hundred percent of people have a story and yeah. sometimes it's it's the fear or it's the I don't know where to start kind of thing. 100%. And like I think having a course like this is going to be so beneficial for so many people to take that first step, even if it takes them a couple years instead of 30 days. But actually being able to sit down and especially if it's a goal of yours or if it's a passion, like you're going to make it work. You're yeah. going to find a way. Yeah, absolutely. I had a video on TikTok or whatever, and, you know, we were kind of talking about, like, why haven't you written a book, mm -hmm. you know? And, like, there, you know, that's the number one reason is most people don't know where to start, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not just trying – like, we've already talked about it. Like, I don't care about the money, right? Mm -hmm. Like, find me on social media, whatever, reach out. Like, if I can answer a question, point in the right direction, hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z, like – that's a win for me, right? right? If they end up publishing their book and they come back to me and they're like, Aaron, like what you said to me, like help me kind of like do this and do that. And they they wrote a book, like that's the most rewarding mm -hmm. thing ever. Um, and so now I can say honestly, like through business and entrepreneurship, like it's, it's, it's about helping people, not just mm -hmm. getting the bag. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what keeps it sustainable long-term mm -hmm. versus, you know, just getting the quick you know, the quick grab, money grab. Mm -hmm. so. All right. So in closing, first of all, I want to thank you so much for being here. But I have one more question. So you've been through a lot. And I want to thank you for sharing everything that you've shared on the pod and for coming on and being so vulnerable. Absolutely. Is there anything, any pieces of advice or encouragement for anyone that feels like, okay, my head's underwater. I don't know what to do. I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm not sure how I'm going to get out of this. So your pride will kill any hope that you have of mm -hmm. moving forward. Because when I, you know, came from, you know, making five figure months to, you know, living in one of the nice, nicest neighborhoods in, in, in Tulsa, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like if I wouldn't have had the humility to be able to go back and say, you know what, I got to do whatever it takes. First, it started with my relationship. I made that a priority and I moved back, you know, to try to save that, um, you know, do whatever it takes. And, and, and I mean, if, you know, I hate, hate to keep going back to like, don't quit or refuse to quit. The book that I'm writing is like, it's so true though. Mm -hmm. You just have to refuse to quit. You yeah. have to refuse to give up. Like, you know, the old little, little, uh, song, you know, the wheels on the bus go round and round. Like, like you will have low points in your life, but you will come up again as long mm -hmm. as you don't quit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, losing, you know, close to a quarter million dollars, you know, from a business partner, taking over 120 grand of debt in the divorce. I could have given her half the debt. Mm -hmm. 
You know, like if that was 120 grand assets, you know, dang well, she probably would take half. Mm -hmm. Like I chose not to, I knew that would probably destroy, like, I was like, I know my ability to recoup that. So Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm going to shoulder it all. Like that was crazy. And it was extremely stressful. And, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, like cold sweats and like stress and like Mm -hmm. going back to work, like selling cell phones, like, like the Verizon gate, like there's so much more, like I hadn't even really touched on, but like, um, you know, it, it's true. Like as long as you don't quit, like things mm-hmm. will get better. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I truly believe that as long as you don't give up, like things can get better from you mm-hmm. for, for you, you know? Right. Um, so my best piece of advice for somebody who's going through maybe the lowest point in their life is one, whatever happened to you, whatever experience you've gone through, it doesn't define you. That is not who you are. Those thoughts that are coming, come on, like those thoughts that are coming, undefined, <laughs> like those thoughts that are coming, like do they're not your own thoughts, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's outside forces in this world that are going to come to try to tell you that your life mm-hmm. is over. You aren't worth, you know, anything mm-hmm. like your life is just completely done. And if you believe those lies, like, yeah, like you can, you know, you may give up. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, I don't know, you know, like obviously I said, you know, God was a huge role in me not, you know, killing myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but also just deciding like, hey, you know what? Like I've been up, I've been down. Mm-hmm. Like I know it can get better. You know, if I've done it once, done it twice, I can mm-hmm. do it again. But I would encourage people like, hey, surround yourself with people that are going the direction you want to go. Mm-hmm. Right. Like that's huge. Through what we went through the last couple of years, everyone was very isolated. They weren't going out. They weren't doing all these things. And it was detrimental. You know, because like you need to be able to go out and chop it up with friends, like and mm-hmm. and like even meeting you. You know what I'm saying? Like just mm-hmm. learning what you've done with your business. Like, oh, okay, what about this? What about that? Like, mm-hmm. it's inspiring. It's motivating. It's like, oh, if she did it, I can do it. You know, mm-hmm. if Aaron did it, like I can do it. You right. know, and I believe that 100. percent Um. So yeah, I mean, that would just be my 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 thing is like refuse to refuse to quit. Mm-hmm. Don't give up. Like things can turn around. Yeah. Yeah. For you. So. I love that. And then to piggyback off of something you said about like the negative thoughts, the negative self-talk that we have, there's a book that I read, um, The Power of Positive Imaging by Norman Vincent Peale. He was a Mm. pastor. I loved that book. And one of the things in there that I took away from it was that any negative things are not from self and they're not from God. And like you need to look at those things as like, I mean, I say this to myself all the time. Anytime I'm thinking a negative thought, anytime I have anxiety come up, I literally say in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, get out. Mm. And because I know that that's something in my head that's not from me and it's not placed on my heart from God. I know it's not mine. It's not mine to carry. It's not my negativity. It's some other outside source. And like that's something that has been really huge for me to kind of dissociate from the negative thoughts knowing that it's not mine. And I think if anyone listening has those thoughts, know that it's not from you. Know that it's completely different and try and flip those. Tell yourself the opposite. There were so many times, and I've said this on the podcast before, I had to have sticky notes on my my mirror telling myself like, you're enough. Mm. Like you're great. You have a voice that needs to be shared. You have value to offer to people. And it's so important to, even if you're going through things. And I remember at one point in my life, I was $20,000 in debt, Mm. which is nowhere near what you were, (laughs) but it was like, I felt like my life was over. I felt like I was never going to be able to get out of that. Mm. And I think if you're able to have a clear vision of this is the plan that I'm going to attack to get myself out of this hundred and be dedicated to that plan, you're going to see the light at the end of the tunnel and you're going to start to chip away at that. And it's going to start to feel freeing. And another thing that I learned from the positive imaging book was mainly about like vision, like I'm a huge, like manifestation I believe in, but I also like back my faith with that as well It's like mine is in prayer more mm. than like visualizing myself with all these things because action has to follow that visu- visualization for as sure. well. But for me, visualizing myself, asking myself, journaling, writing down, what does it feel like to be debt free? What does it feel like to be happy? What does it feel like to 
you know, accomplish the goals that I have for myself and being able to like, honestly, just sit with that. And instead of like knowing I was $20,000 in debt, my prayers were, thank you, God, for helping me be debt free. Hmm. Thank you for giving me this peace in my life. Thank you for X, Y, Z. And I feel like that really helped me. And if you're not spiritual in the faith based sense, you know, it's God for me, but maybe it's the universe for you or energy or spirit or whatever that is, whatever you have to do to talk yourself through that. But for me, it was like, it was God and it was my prayer and, you know, might be meditation for you, but like that is something that really helped me look at things a little differently. I agree. hundred (laughs) percent. That's powerful. People have crazy experiences in life. Life is not going to hold back any punches, right? Mm -mm. Like, you know, you get these narratives, you know, this privilege, that privilege, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, sure. Your starting point may be different, Mm -hmm. right? But if you're any kind of, you know, like entrepreneur, business owner, whatever, like you're going to encounter something at some point in that that space of time where you may have to start over. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and so the starting point was completely irrelevant anyways. Right. right? And so it's like, it's like the person that, 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 that chooses not to, to yield to those thoughts that are not our own, like Mm -hmm. it, it, it it changes the game, you know, hundred percent. So I love that. Absolutely. Well, I think this is the end of our episode. Thank you again so much for coming. I've loved this conversation. I hope you guys love this. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe and check out every episode on Thursdays at 10 a.m. Also, don't forget to use code CHRISTMAS for 20% off all online courses, coaching, and in-person trainings. And we'll see you guys in the next one.